Chapter 3 of the Interesting Narrative of the Life of Elauda Equiano. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Carl Manchester, 2007. The Interesting Narrative of the Life of Elauda Equiano. Chapter 3 The author is carried to Virginia. His distress. Surprise at seeing a picture and a watch is bought by Captain Pascal and sets out for England. His terror during the voyage, arrives in England. His wonder at a fall of snow, is sent to Guernsey and in some time goes on board a ship of war with his master. Some account of the expedition against Louisbourg under the command of Admiral Boscawen in 1758. I now totally lost the small remains of comfort I had enjoyed in conversing with my countrymen. The women too, who used to wash and take care of me, were all gone different ways, and I never saw one of them afterwards. I stayed in this island for a few days, I believe it could not be above a fortnight, when I and some few more slaves, that were not saleable amongst the rest from very much fretting, were shipped off in a sloop for North America. On the passage we were better treated than when we were coming from Africa, and we had plenty of rice and fat pork. We were landed up a river a good way from the sea about Virginia country, where we saw few or none of our native Africans, and not one soul who could talk to me. I was a few weeks weeding grass and gathering stones in a plantation, and at last all my companions were distributed different ways, and only myself was left. I was now exceedingly miserable, and thought myself worse off than any of the rest of my companions, for they could talk to each other but I had no person to speak to that I could understand. In this state I was constantly grieving and pining, and wishing for death rather than anything else. While I was in this plantation, the gentleman, to whom I supposed the estate belonged, being unwell, I was one day sent for to his dwelling-house to fan him. When I came into the room where he was, I was very much affrighted at some things I saw, and the more so as I had seen a black woman slave as I came through the house who was cooking the dinner, and the poor creature was cruelly loaded with various kinds of iron machines. She had one particularly on her head, which locked her mouth so fast that she could scarcely speak, and could not eat nor drink. I was much astonished and shocked at this contrivance, which I afterwards learned was called the iron muzzle. Soon after I had a fan put into my hand, to fan the gentleman while he slept. And so I did indeed, with great fear. While he was fast asleep, I indulged myself a great deal in looking about the room, which to me appeared very fine and curious. The first object that engaged my attention was a watch which hung on the chimney and was going. I was quite surprised at the noise it made, and was afraid it would tell the gentleman anything I might do amiss, and when I immediately after observed a picture hanging in the room which appeared constantly to look at me, I was still more affrighted having never seen such things as these before. At one time I thought it was something relative to magic, and not seeing it move, I thought it might be some way the whites had to keep their great men when they died, and offer them libation, as we used to do to our friendly spirits. In this state of anxiety I remained till my master awoke, when I was dismissed out of the room, to my no small satisfaction and relief, for I thought that these people were all made up of wonders. In this place I was called Jacob, but on board the African snow I was called Michael. I had been some time in this miserable, forlorn, and much dejected state, without having any one to talk to, which made my life a burden, when the kind and unknown hand of the Creator, who in very deed leads the blind in a way they know not, now began to appear, to my comfort. For one day the captain of a merchant ship, called the Industrious Bee, came on some business to my master's house. This gentleman, whose name was Michael Henry Pascal, was a lieutenant in the Royal Navy, but now commanded this trading ship, which was somewhere in the confines of the country, many miles off. While he was at my master's house, it happened that he saw me, and liked me so well that he made a purchase of me. I think I have often heard him say that he gave thirty or forty pounds sterling for me, but I do not now remember which. However, he meant me for a present to some of his friends in England, and I was sent accordingly from the house of my then master, one Mr. Campbell, to the place where the ship lay. 
I was conducted on horseback by an elderly black man, a mode of travelling which appeared very odd to me. When I arrived I was carried on board a fine large ship, loaded with tobacco, etc., and just ready to sail for England. I now thought my condition much mended. I had sails to lie on, and plenty of good victuals to eat, and everybody on board used me very kindly, quite contrary to what I had seen of any white people before. I therefore began to think that they were not all of the same disposition. A few days after I was on board, we sailed for England. I was still at a loss to conjecture my destiny. By this time, however, I could smatter a little imperfect English, and I wanted to know as well as I could where we were going. Some of the people of the ship used to tell me that they were going to carry me back to my own country, and this made me very happy. I was quite rejoiced at the sound of going back, and thought if I should get home what wonders I should have to tell. But I was reserved for another fate, and was soon undeceived when we came within sight of the English coast. While I was on board this ship, my captain and master named me Gustavus Vassar. I, at that time, began to understand him a little, and refused to be called so, and told him as well as I could that I would be called Jacob, but he said I should not, and still called me Gustavus. And when I refused to answer to my new name, which at first I did, it gave me many a cuff. So at length I submitted, and was obliged to bear the present name by which I have been known ever since. The ship had a very long passage, and on that account we had very short allowance of provisions. Towards the last we had only one pound and a half of bread per week, and about the same quantity of meat, and one quart of water a day. We spoke with only one vessel the whole time we were at sea, and but once we caught a few fishes. In our extremities the captain and people told me in jest they would kill me and eat me, but I thought them in earnest, and was depressed beyond measure, expecting every moment to be my last. While I was in this situation, one evening they caught, with a good deal of trouble, a large shark, and got it on board. This gladdened my poor heart exceedingly, as I thought it would serve the people to eat instead of their eating me. But very soon, to my astonishment, they cut off a small part of the tail, and tossed the rest over the side. This renewed my consternation, and I did not know what to think of these white people, though I very much feared they would kill and eat me. There was on board the ship a young lad who had never been at sea before, about four or five years older than myself. His name was Richard Barker. He was a native of America, had received an excellent education, and was of a most amiable temper. Soon after I went on board, he showed me a great deal of partiality and attention, and in return I grew extremely fond of him. We at length became inseparable, and, for the space of two years, he was of very great use to me, and was my constant companion and instructor. Although this dear youth had many slaves of his own, yet he and I have gone through many sufferings together on shipboard, and we have many nights lain in each other's bosoms when we were in great distress. Thus such a friendship was cemented between us as we cherished till his death, which, to my very great sorrow, happened in the year 1759, when he was up the archipelago on board His Majesty's ship the Preston, an event which I have never ceased to regret, as I lost at once a kind interpreter, an agreeable companion, and a faithful friend, who, at the age of fifteen, discovered a mind superior to prejudice, and who was not ashamed to notice, to associate with, and to be the friend and instructor of one who was ignorant, a stranger, of a different complexion, and a slave. My master had lodged in his mother's house in America, he respected him very much, and made him always eat with him in the cabin. He used often to tell him jocularly that he would kill me to eat. Sometimes he would say to me, the black people were not good to eat, and would ask me if we did not eat people in my country. I said, no. Then he said he would kill Dick, as he always called him, first, and afterwards me. Though this hearing relieved my mind a little as to myself, I was alarmed for Dick, and whenever he was called I used to be very much afraid he was to be killed, and I would peep and watch to see if they were going to kill him. Nor was I free from this consternation till we made the land. One night we lost a man overboard, 
and the cries and noise were so great and confused in stopping the ship that i who did not know what was the matter began as usual to be very much afraid and to think they were going to make an offering with me and perform some magic which i still believed they dealt in as the waves were very high i thought the ruler of the seas was angry and i expected to be offered up to appease him this filled my mind with agony and i could not any more that night close my eyes again to rest however when daylight appeared i was a little eased in my mind but still every time i was called i used to think it was to be killed some time after this we saw some very large fish which i afterwards found were called grampuses they looked to me extremely terrible and made their appearance just at dusk and were so near as to blow the water on the ship's deck i believed them to be the rulers of the sea and as the white people did not make any offerings at any time i thought they were angry with them and at last what confirmed my belief was the wind just then died away and a calm ensued and in consequence of it the ship stopped going i suppose that the fish had performed this and i hid myself in the fore part of the ship through fear of being offered up to appease them every minute peeping and quaking but my good friend dick came shortly towards me and i took an opportunity to ask him as well as i could what these fish were not being able to talk much english i could but just make him understand my question and not at all when i asked him if any offerings were to be made to them however he told me these fish would swallow anybody which sufficiently alarmed me here he was called away by the captain who was leaning over the quarter-deck railing and looking at the fish and most of the people were busied in getting a barrel of pitch to light for them to play with the captain now called me to him having learned some of my apprehensions from dick and having diverted himself and others for some time with my fears which appeared ludicrous enough in my crying and trembling he dismissed me the barrel of pitch was now lighted and put over the side into the water by this time it was just dark and the fish went after it and to my great joy i saw them no more however all my alarms began to subside when we got sight of land and at last the ship arrived at falmouth after a passage of thirteen weeks every heart on board seemed gladdened on our reaching the shore and none more than mine the captain immediately went on shore and set on board some fresh provisions which we wanted very much we made good use of them and our famine was soon turned into feasting almost without ending it was about the beginning of the spring 1757 when i arrived in england and i was near twelve years of age at that time i was very much struck with the buildings and the pavement of the streets in falmouth and indeed any object i saw filled me with new surprise one morning when i got upon deck i saw it covered all over with the snow that fell overnight as i had never seen anything of that kind before i thought it was salt so i immediately ran down to the mate and desired him as well as i could to come and see how somebody in the night had thrown salt all over the deck he knowing what it was desired me to bring some of it down to him accordingly i took up a handful of it which i found very cold indeed and when i brought it to him he desired me to taste it i did so and i was surprised beyond measure i then asked him what it was he told me it was snow but i could not in any wise understand him he asked me if we had no such thing in my country and i told him no i then asked him the use of it and who made it he told me a great man in the heavens called god but here again i was to all intents and purposes at a loss to understand him and the more so when a little after i saw the air filled with it in a heavy shower which fell down on the same day after this i went to church and having never been at such a place before i was again amazed at seeing and hearing the service i asked all i could about it and they gave me to understand it was worshipping god who made us and all things i was still at a great loss and soon got into an endless field of inquiries as well as i was able to speak and ask about things however my little friend dick used to be my best interpreter for i could make free with him and he always instructed me with pleasure and from what i could understand by him of this god and in seeing these little white people did not sell one another as we did i was much pleased and in this i thought they were much happier than we africans 
I was astonished at the wisdom of the white people in all things I saw, but was amazed at their not sacrificing, or making any offerings, and eating with unwashed hands, and touching the dead. I likewise could not help remarking the particular slenderness of their women, which I did not at first like, and I thought they were not so modest and shamefaced as the African women. I had often seen my master and Dick employed in reading, and I had a great curiosity to talk to the books, as I thought they did, and so to learn how all things had a beginning. For that purpose I have often taken up a book, and have talked to it, and then put my ears to it when alone, in hopes it would answer me, and I have been very much concerned when I found it remained silent. My master lodged at the house of a gentleman in Falmouth, who had a fine little daughter, about six or seven years of age, and she grew prodigiously fond of me, insomuch that we used to eat together, and had servants to wait on us. I was so much caressed by this family, that it often reminded me of the treatment I had received from my little noble African master. After I had been here a few days, I was sent on board of the ship, but the child cried so much after me, that nothing could pacify her till I was sent for again. It is ludicrous enough that I began to fear I should be betrothed to this young lady, and when my master asked me if I would stay there with her behind him, as he was going away with the ship, which he had taken in the tobacco again, I cried immediately, and said I would not leave her. At last, by stealth, one night I was sent on board the ship again, and in a little time we sailed for Guernsey, where she was in part owned by a merchant, one Nicholas Dobery. As I was now amongst the people who had not their faces scarred, like some of the African nations where I had been, I was very glad I did not let them ornament me in that manner when I was with them. When we arrived at Guernsey, my master placed me to board and lodge with one of his mates, who had a wife and family there, and some months afterwards he went to England and left me in care of this mate, together with my friend Dick. This mate had a little daughter, aged about five or six years, with whom I used to be much delighted. I had often observed that when her mother washed her face it looked very rosy, but when she washed mine it did not look so. I therefore tried oftentimes myself, if I could not by washing, make my face of the same colour as my little playmate, Mary. But it was all in vain, and I now began to be mortified at the difference in our complexions. This woman behaved to me with great kindness and attention and taught me everything in the same manner as she did her own child, and indeed, in every respect, treated me as such. I remained here till the summer of the year 1757, when my master, being appointed first lieutenant of His Majesty's ship the Roebuck, sent for Dick and me, and his old mate. On this we all left Guernsey, and set out for England, in a sloop bound for London. As we were coming towards the Nor, where the Roebuck lay, a man of war's boat came alongside to press our people, on which each man ran to hide himself. I was very much frightened at this, though I did not know what it meant, or what to think or do. However, I went and hid myself also under a hen coop. Immediately afterwards, the press gang came on board with their swords drawn, and searched all about, pulled the people out by force, and put them into the boat. At last I was found out also, the man that forced me held me up by the heels while they all made their sport of me, I roaring and crying out all the time most lustily. But at last the mate, who was my conductor, seeing this, came to my assistance, and did all he could to pacify me, but all to very little purpose, till I had seen the boat go off. Soon afterwards we came to the Nor, where the roebuck lay, and, to our great joy, my master came on board to us, and brought us to the ship. When I went on board this large ship, I was amazed indeed to see the quantity of men and the guns. However, my surprise began to diminish as my knowledge increased, and I ceased to feel those apprehensions and alarms which had taken such strong possession of me when I first came among the Europeans, and for some time after. I began now to pass to an opposite extreme. I was so far from being afraid of any new thing which I saw that, after I had been some time on the ship, I even began to long for a battle. My griefs too, which in young minds are not perpetual, were now wearing away, and I soon enjoyed myself pretty well, and felt tolerably easy in my present situation. There was a number of boys on board, which still made it more agreeable, for we were always together, and a great part of our time was spent in play. 
I remained in this ship a considerable time, during which we made several cruises, and visited a variety of places. Among others, we were twice in Holland, and brought over several persons of distinction from it, whose names I do not now remember. On the passage, one day, for the diversion of those gentlemen, all the boys were called on the quarter-deck, and were paired proportionably, and then made to fight, after which the gentlemen gave the combatants from five to nine shillings each. This was the first time I ever fought with a white boy, and I never knew what it was to have a bloody nose before. This made me fight most desperately, I suppose considerably more than an hour, and at last, both of us being weary, we were parted. I had a great deal of this kind of sport afterwards, in which the captain in the ship's company used very much to encourage me. Some time afterwards, the ship went to Leith in Scotland, and from thence to the Orkneys, where I was surprised in seeing scarcely any night, and from thence we sailed with a great fleet full of soldiers for England. All this time we had never come to an engagement, though we were frequently cruising off the coast of France, during which we chased many vessels, and took in all seventeen prizes. I had been learning many of the manoeuvres of the ship during our cruise, and I was several times made to fire the guns. One evening, off Havre de Grasse, just as it was growing dark, we were standing off shore, and met with a fine, large, French-built frigate. We got all things immediately ready for fighting, and I now expected I should be gratified in seeing an engagement, which I had so long wished for in vain. But the very moment the word of command was given to fire, we heard those on board the other ship cry, Haul down the jib! and in that instant she hoisted English colours. There was instantly with us an amazing cry of Avast, or Stop Firing, and I think one or two guns had been let off, but happily they did no mischief. We had hailed them several times, but they not hearing, we received no answer, which was the cause of our firing. The boat was then sent on board of her, and she proved to be the ambuscade man of war, to my no small disappointment. We returned to Portsmouth without having been in any action, just at the trial of Admiral Bing, whom I saw several times during it, and, my master having left the ship and gone to London for promotion, Dick and I were put on board the savage sloop of war, and we went in her to assist the bringing off of the St. George man of war, that had run ashore somewhere on the coast. After staying a few weeks on board the savage, Dick and I were sent on shore at Deal, where we remained some short time, till my master sent for us to London, the place I had long desired exceedingly to see. We therefore both with great pleasure got into a wagon and came to London, where we were received by a Mr. Gurin, a relation of my master. This gentleman had two sisters, very amiable ladies, who took much notice and great care of me. Though I had desired so much to see London, when I arrived in it, I was unfortunately unable to gratify my curiosity, for I had at this time the chilblains to such a degree that I could not stand for several months, and I was obliged to be sent to St. George's Hospital. There I grew so ill that the doctors wanted to cut my leg off at different times, apprehending a mortification, but I always said I would rather die than suffer it, and happily, I thank God, I recovered without the operation. After being there several weeks, and just as I had recovered, the smallpox broke out on me, so that I was again confined, and I thought myself now particularly unfortunate. However, I soon recovered again, and by this time, my master having been promoted to be first lieutenant of the Preston Man of War of fifty guns, then new at Deptford, Dick and I were sent on board her, and soon after we went to Holland to bring over the late Duke of Blank to England. While I was in this ship, an incident happened, which though trifling, I beg leave to relate, as I could not help taking particular notice of it, and considering it then as a judgment of God. One morning a young man was looking up to the foretop, and in a wicked tone, common on shipboard, damned his eyes about something. Just at that moment some small particles of dirt fell into his left eye, and by that evening it was very much inflamed. The next day it grew worse, and within six or seven days he lost it. From this ship my master was appointed a lieutenant on board the Royal George. When he was going he wished me to stay on board the Preston, to learn the French horn, but the ship being ordered for Turkey, I could not think of leaving my master, to whom I was very warmly attached, 
and I told him if he left me behind it would break my heart. This prevailed on him to take me with him, but he left Dick on board the Preston, whom I embraced at parting for the last time. The Royal George was the largest ship I have ever seen, so that when I came on board her I was surprised at the number of people, men, women and children, of every denomination, and the largeness of the guns, and many of them also of brass, which I had never seen before. Here were also shops or stalls of every kind of goods, and people crying their different commodities about the ship as in a town. To me it appeared a little world, into which I was again cast without a friend, for I had no longer my dear companion Dick. We did not stay long here. My master was not many weeks on board before he got an appointment to be sixth lieutenant of the Namur, which was then at Spithead, fitting up for a vice-admiral Boscowan, who was going with a large fleet on an expedition against Louisbourg. The crew of the Royal George were turned over to her, and the flag of that gallant admiral was hoisted on board, the blue at the main-top gallant masthead. There was a very great fleet of men of war of every description assembled together for this expedition, and I was in hopes soon to have an opportunity of being gratified with a sea-fight. All things being now in readiness, this mighty fleet, for there was also Admiral Cornish's fleet in company, destined for the East Indies, at last weighed anchor and sailed. The two fleets continued in company for several days, and then parted. Admiral Cornish in the Lennox, having first saluted our Admiral in the Namur when he returned, we then steered for America, but by contrary winds we were driven to Tenerife, where I was struck with its noted peak. Its prodigious height and its form, resembling a sugar loaf, filled me with wonder. We remained in sight of this island some days, and then proceeded for America, which we soon made and got into a very commodious harbour called St. George in Halifax, where we had fish in great plenty, and all other fresh provisions. We were here joined by different men of war and transport ships with soldiers, after which, our fleet being increased to a prodigious number of ships of all kinds, we sailed for Cape Breton in Nova Scotia. We had the good and gallant General Wolfe on board our ship, whose affability made him highly esteemed and beloved by all the men. He often honoured me, as well as the other boys, with marks of his notice, and saved me once a flogging for fighting with a young gentleman. We arrived at Cape Breton in the summer of 1758, and here the soldiers were to be landed, in order to make an attack upon Louisbourg. My master had some part in superintending the landing, and here I was, in a small measure, gratified in seeing an encounter between our men and the enemy. The French were posted on the shore to receive us, and disputed our landing for a long time, but at last they were driven from their trenches, and a complete landing was effected. Our troops pursued them as far as the town of Louisbourg. In this action many were killed on both sides. One thing remarkable I saw this day, a lieutenant of the Princess Amelia, who, as well as my master, superintended the landing, was giving the word of command, and while his mouth was open, a musket ball went through it and passed out at his cheek. I had that day in my hand the scalp of an Indian king who was killed in the engagement. The scalp had been taken off by a Highlander. I saw this king's ornaments too, which were very curious and made of feathers. Our land forces laid siege to the town of Louisbourg while the French men of war were blocked up in the harbour by the fleet, the batteries at the same time playing upon them from the land. This they did with such effect that one day I saw some of the ships set on fire by the shells from the batteries, and I believe two or three of them were quite burnt. At another time about fifty boats belonging to the English men of war, commanded by Captain George Balfour of the Etna fireship and another junior captain, La Fauri, attacked and boarded the only two remaining French men of war in the harbour. They also set fire to a seventy-gun ship, but a sixty-four called the Bien Faison, they brought off. During my stay here I had often an opportunity of being near Captain Balfour, who was pleased to notice me, and liked me so much that he often asked my master to let him have me, but he would not part with me, and no consideration could have induced me to leave him. At last Louisbourg was taken, and the English men of war came into the harbour before it, to my very great joy for I had now more liberty of indulging myself, and I went often on shore. When the ships were in the harbour, 
we had the most beautiful procession on the water I ever saw. All the admirals and captains of the men of war, full dressed and in their barges, well ornamented with pendants, came alongside of the Namur. The vice admiral then went on shore in his barge, followed by the other officers in order of seniority, to take possession, as I suppose, of the town and fort. Some time after this, the French governor and his lady, and other persons of note, came on board our ship to dine. On this occasion our ships were dressed with colours of all kinds, from the top-gallant masthead to the deck, and this, with the firing of guns, formed a most grand and magnificent spectacle. As soon as everything here was settled, Admiral Boscawen sailed with part of the fleet for England, leaving some ships behind with the rear admirals Sir Charles Hardy and Durrell. It was now winter, and one evening, during our passage home about dusk, when we were in the channel, or near soundings, and were beginning to look for land, we descried seven sails of a large man of war, which stood offshore. Several people on board our ship said, as the two fleets were, in forty minutes from the first sight, within hail of each other, that they were English men of war, and some of our people even began to name some of the ships. By this time both fleets began to mingle, and our admiral ordered his flag to be hoisted. At that instant the other fleet, which were French, hoisted their ensigns, and gave us a broadside as they passed by. Nothing could create greater surprise and confusion among us than this. The wind was high, the sea rough, and we had our lower and middle deck guns housed in, so that not a single gun on board was ready to be fired at any of the French ships. However, the Royal William and the Somerset, being our sternmost ships, became a little prepared, and each gave the French ships a broadside as they passed by. I afterwards heard this was a French squadron, commanded by Monsieur Conflant, and certainly, had the Frenchmen known our condition, and had a mind to fight us, they might have done us greater mischief, but we were not long before we were prepared for an engagement. Immediately many things were tossed overboard, the ships were made ready for fighting as soon as possible, and about ten at night we had bent a new mainsail, the old one being split. Being now in readiness for fighting, we wore ship, and stood after the French fleet, who were one or two ships in number more than we. However, we gave them chase, and continued pursuing them all night, and at daylight we saw six of them, all large ships of the line, and an English East Indiaman, a prize they had taken. We chased them all day, till between three and four o'clock in the evening, when we came up with and passed within a musket shot of one seventy-four gun ship, and the Indiaman also, who now hoisted her colours, but immediately hauled them down again. On this we made a signal for the other ships to take possession of her, and supposing the man of war would likewise strike, we cheered, but she did not, though if we had fired into her from being so near, we must have taken her. To my utter surprise the Somerset, who was the next ship astern of the Namur, made way likewise, and, thinking they were sure of this French ship, they cheered in the same manner, but still continued to follow us. The French Commodore was about a gunshot ahead of all, running from us with all speed, and about four o'clock he carried his foretop mast overboard. This caused another loud cheer with us, and a little after the top mast came close by us, but, to our great surprise, instead of coming up with her, we found she went as fast as ever, if not faster, in the very same direction, and so near that we heard people talk as she went by, yet not a shot was fired on either side, and about five or six o'clock, just as it grew dark, she joined her commodore. We chased all night, but the next day they were out of sight, so that we saw no more of them, and we only had the old Indiaman, called Carnarvon, I think, for our trouble. After this we stood in for the channel, and soon made the land, and about the close of the year 1758-9 we got safe to St. Helens. Here the Namur ran aground, and also another large ship astern of us. But, by starting our water, and tossing many things overboard to lighten her, we got the ships off without any damage. We stayed for a short time at Spithead, and then went into Portsmouth Harbour to refit, from whence the Admiral went to London, and my master and I soon followed, with a press gang, as we wanted some hands to complete our complement. End of chapter 3